This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Next, on Up Next. We're building these machines. They're not building themselves. We're building. We can build whatever we want. So it's this idea that the robots are building themselves or taking away or running amok from us and out of control. This is nonsense. Welcome to Up Next, I'm Marty Lasden, and on this edition we consider the future of artificial intelligence with Jeffrey Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins became both rich and famous back in the 1990s when he invented the Palm Pilot, a device that in no small way ushered in a whole new era of mobile computing. These days, though, he's on a far more ambitious and, dare I say, audacious mission. His goal? to build a machine that can think and reason on its own by utilizing the principles that govern the human brain. That is the vision behind the company that he co-founded back in 2005 called Nomenta. And now, 10 years later, he's as confident as ever that he will actually pull it off. Jeffrey Hawkins, welcome to Up Next. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Marty. I, I want to begin this conversation on a personal note. I, I spend an awful lot of my time worrying about things. You know, for example, you know, I wash my hands a lot because I'm worried about dying from a deadly virus. I, I worry about the strength of the Swiss franc in relation to the euro. <laughs> I worry about overpopulation. I worry about the problems associated with an aging population. and. Uh, and of course I worry about asteroids. But, you know, it was only since last December, actually, that I started uh, worrying about the possibility that intelligent machines will soon be taking over the world and killing us all. <laughs> and, and the reason I started worrying was because one of the world's most famous scientists, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, he gave an interview to the BBC. Yeah. And, and, and he said, and let me read the quote, he said, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Now that's Stephen Hawking talking, uh, but how afraid do you think I should be of, of what it is that you and others like you are up to? Uh, I don't think you should be worried at all, actually. Not at all? Not at all. Not at all. And um, it's interesting, most of the people who are expressing concern about this actually have no idea what is actually going to transpire. It's uh, they're not working in the field, they're not familiar with the field, um, and there's a lot of misinformation about it. Uh, I feel myself and my company, Numenta, are actually one of the places that this is most likely to occur. And um, so I'm, I'm in the midst of it. I can see what is going to happen, and I can see what, how it's playing out, and it's, it is very different than people think it is. It's nothing at all like people think it is. There are things you should be scared about. Mm -hmm. There are some things you should really be scared about. You should be scared about things that self-reproduce. That's something that you should be scared about. Now, we today like, we have like us. Well, well, to other species, we're pretty dangerous. Yeah, uh, maybe to our own survival, our self-replication is dangerous. Viruses are dangerous. Computer viruses are dangerous. There's things that are that really could be dangerous if they got out of control, and many people conflate things they think about like humans. Like we did a lot, we, we damaged this earth because we grew, we killed all these other species that somehow uh, a machine intelligence is like a species. It's just going to take over and grow like a species. It's not. No one's creating life here. No one's creating things that self-replicate. Uh, we're just basically figuring out how the brain works and reverse engineering that and build machines that work on those principles and not even the entire brain. Just the neocortex, just the parts that are smart, not the parts that are emotional or lustful and need to have you know, anger lessons and things like that. We're not dealing with that part of the brain. We're just talking about part of the brain, and that's the stuff we want to reproduce. There may be a whole separate other evil scientists who are off in the world trying to create, re, you know, recreate living robot-like entities, but that's not what machine intelligence is about. You dismiss the notion of an information explosion occurring. Yeah. This is the idea that once machines 
uh, develop the ability to perfect themselves that within a short period of time they'll be a thousand times smarter than we are and then just t turn around and crush us yeah, like bugs. Yeah, the idea that, yeah. it's the idea that a machine that can build a machine that's yeah. smarter than itself then and builds then a machine that's smarter than itself. Yeah, and again, this is, our, this is the idea that intelligence yeah. is some sort of like uh, magic sauce and you just put more sauce in. Right. You know, you turn up the dial. Uh, it, it's not like that. I mean, humans are far smarter than we are because we have a brain that can learn almost anything. You know, our brain is not much changed in the last several hundred thousand years, right? And we are, mm -hmm. why, what's different about us now? Well, we, we've learned, we've got an environment, we have better learning systems, we have, we have history, we have language, we have uh, written and cultural things like this program where we can share knowledge. We've already been smarter than we've been. And, and we don't have this explosion in the sense other than the fact that we can learn more. So the point is, if, you, if I could build a machine today that was a um, hundred times more capable than a human, it, just, it doesn't have this knowledge all instantly. It has to build up an infrastructure of knowledge around it. You have to... But, but apart, say, from hosting a talk show, yeah. is there any job that a human does now that a machine won't be able to do as well or better in, say, the next 50 years? Oh, I'm sh there are, yes. In the, same sense, in the same sense, look at computers, right? Computers have been around since like 1950 and they're basically current form, so let's say 65 years or so. Um, have they replaced huge numbers of jobs? Absolutely. You could just make a list all day long of the jobs that computers have replaced. Mm -hmm. Have we been all put out of work? You know, are our lives impoverished because of that? Of course not. And I'm assured by that. I, I, I like, I, I'm comforted by what you're saying. But, you know, on the other hand, I mean, it is unsettling that a guy like Hans Moravec, who uh, he's at Carnegie Mellon, he heads up one of the largest robotics programs in yeah. the world. He predicts that by 2040, there will be no jobs that a human can do that a robot won't be able to well, do better. Well, maybe he knows that, right? So that's a different thing. I'm not building robots. Right. right, but the artificial technology will uh, be well, incorporated well, like, well, like, uh, So what? So can computers be incorporated yeah. in robots, right? Yeah. Now, maybe he's right. Maybe he's wrong. I don't know. But um, you know, I suspect that's a little bit of hyperbole. Well, uh, even if he's just half right. Well, I, I think it's not right, but okay. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll concede he is a, uh, a more expert in robotics. I'm more expert, perhaps, probably. I'm far more expert, almost certainly, in how brains do this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I'll just say, uh, well, maybe if he's right, then we should be careful about what he's doing. But that really, you know, what I'm doing doesn't necessarily make that true. Uh, and it doesn't impact, what he, I don't think he's right, but if he were, yeah. you know, if there's some existential risk to robotics, then we ought to be looking at the existential risk to robotics. Okay, but I don't see a huge distinction between well, robotics and artificial I, intelligence. I do. Um, you know, for example, today, these uh, people building robotics, almost none of them are thinking about brains. None of them. So he's mm -hmm. making those predictions without thinking about, we're going to understand how brains work. He's making those predictions completely independently of the work that I'm doing. Uh, and because roboticists don't really generally think about brains too much. They think about, how am I going to build this physical robot that does various things, and what are the learning rules I'm going to use, blah, blah, blah. Right. So his, his threat, he's saying there, is almost certainly ignorant of the kind of work that I'm doing. Right. And so if he believes there's a threat, fine. Uh, but it's not based on what I'm doing uh, or about reverse engineering the brain. It's based on some other thing he's thinking about. So uh, I think you just have to, it's be careful, we have to be careful to tease apart this. And the problem, the problem is it's, it's so easy to fall into the, 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 the popular culture aspect of what these things are about. And um, you know, just like the popular culture aspects of robotics. You know, robotics didn't turn out to be anything at all like people thought it was going to be back in the day of, you know, the, the original robot play, you know. Um, we don't have R2-D2 and C-3PO walking around here talking to us, right? It's, uh, so I'm just trying to think through, though, the, the sociological implications. I mean, certainly cab drivers are toast. I mean... But they, not because of my work. That's already happening. Well, but again, you know, it's the artifact. Yeah, that's right. right? And, I mean, they think that Uber's an issue. Wait yeah. till the fleets of self-driving cars yeah, really, I think, pour into I town. I think, it's, Marty, it's really important to, to separate these things out yeah, and, yeah. Not, and not just conflate the whole thing and put them in one bucket. Um, right. So, great. There you go. You know, are cab drivers in, in jeopardy? Yeah. Are yeah. car companies in jeopardy? Yeah. 
Has there ever and been? And it's not just cab drivers, right? I mean, in a world where machines are driving our cars, yeah. flying our planes, diagnosing our illnesses, well, building our buildings, yeah. when, a, when, a, when well, machines well, can do all of that well, and so much I don't more, know, you know, well, let's, what are we going to be? Well, what are you and I going to be doing? This is not going to happen overnight, right? So uh, will machines be building, you know, our buildings? You know, not completely, no. Do they do it? Yeah, sure. There's elevators and they have cranes and they have trucks and they do. These are machines that are building our buildings. Mm -hmm. And so where in the past it might have taken a thousand um, laborers to build some building, now they can do it with a hundred. Okay, yeah, machines are taking over jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've lived with it. It's okay. Your life is good. We're, you know, the, the, we haven't, uh, other than some, you know, we still have problems in this world, but we, it hasn't all fallen apart because of that. You know, I have to tell you that, um, and this is just between you and me, <laughs> and, uh, and, the and, and the cameras. <laughs> when I started reading up on artificial intelligence, and I, you know, I read a bunch of books on it, uh, I have to tell you, I found it very hard to distinguish the profits from the crackpots. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to name names, but let's talk about Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> I mean, here's a guy, I mean, he's a director of engineering at Google. Everybody says he's a genius, and I yeah. have no reason to doubt that. He's got like a, a dozen patents to his name. He invented a, a reading machine yeah. back in the 70s yeah. that has improved the lives of so many people who don't have vision. But he's also the, the same guy now who's uh, consuming 150 vitamins and minerals a day in the hopes of living long enough yeah. so that he'll be able to download his consciousness into a computer yeah. and, and, and by, by doing so achieve a kind of immortality, which he says... Uh, is entirely possible within the next few decades. Yeah. He says all of this with a straight face. Yeah. Uh, how seriously do you think we should take him? Well, he's a very smart guy, and I know I know Ray, and um, I've talked to him multiple times, and um, uh, he is a smart guy. Uh, but he's got a lot of ideas, and some of them are great, and some of them perhaps are not so great, and I'm sure he'll admit the same thing, too. Uh, you know, he's really his best, I think, when he... Uh, talks about accelerating change and the history of accelerating change and so on. Um, but I think on some of these ideas, I just disagree with him. Um, so the idea of downloading your do brain... Do you disagree or do you think he's nuts? I, I, I'm not going to say I think okay. he's nuts. Okay. No one's nuts, right? We, look, you have people, uh, you know, everyone, myself included, has to go out on a limb sometimes promoting ideas that aren't you know, fully accepted yet. And so uh, that can always seem like you're nuts if you do something like that. Um, I think he's wrong about some of the things. So the idea that you could download your brain into a computer, I think he's wrong that that will be possible, and I think he's wrong that that would be desirable. Here's what I think what's interesting about the vision that Kurzweil is conveying, and this is you know all wrapped up in this idea of a singularity, yeah. and, and where well, that gets I guess back the line... To the, that gets back to the intelligence explosion. Right, again. right. But the, 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 the thing that's really interesting to me is that this vision that he's conveying within the circles he's traveling in is inspiring so much awe and so much hope and so much inspiration, it's starting to look a little bit like a religion. Well, there is a, there is a, what do they call themselves, the Singularitans or Singularity? Yeah, well, actually, one observer <laughs> dubbed it the rapture of the nerds. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't subscribe to any of that stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I, I mean, do you think it's starting to look a little bit like a religion? Well, a little bit, sure. But, you know, I mean, and, and it, is the part... intersection of technology and culture has always had a little bit of that flavor, you know, whether it's Star Trek or whether it's... Uh, science fiction stories, you know, there's always been a little bit of that. Um, I, because I think, if it is a religion, then I don't think Ray it's religion. Kurzweil is kind of like... I don't oh. think it's a religion in the, in the sense that um, uh, the dogmas that people believe in today are easily falsified and people will change their mind when they are. And uh, religions basically say, don't you know, ignore what reality, we're going to believe what we believe. Um, but, you know, clearly history will show what's going to happen. We're going to do this stuff, we're going to build machines, think people are going to try to build robots, he's going to try to live forever. We'll see what happens. The day Ray Kurzweil dies might be an eye-opener for some people. There is certainly one thing that you do have in common with Kurt, Mr. Kurzweil, and that, and that is you both believe that the best way to build intelligent machines is to utilize the principles yeah. by which the human brain works. Yes. And, and I guess my question to you is, why would that be? I mean, a brain is a wet, yeah. meaty, yeah. squishy thing, yeah. and a computer is a dry, yeah. uh, transistorized, yeah. silicon-based thing. Why it, would one thing have 
anything to do with the well, other? Well, you know, it's a great question. And I may, finally asked a great question. Yeah, Go well, ahead. All your questions are great. But that, that's a great <laughs> question. And a lot of people have asked that question. And a lot of people have concluded. Including people that you've tried to get money from. Uh, well, that long time ago. Long time ago. Long time ago. Time ago. Yeah. Um, we can go back if you want to, but um, that was, uh, you know, it's a great question. And, and a priori, no one could have said, well, if I want to build an intelligent machine, let's write some, you know, why not just write some software? That's what it seemed obvious to do. Um, and so starting in the 1950s, you know, when the AI movement started, the assumption was this isn't that hard. <laughs> we have a computer. Uh, it's a universal machine. We can program it to do anything. Therefore, let's just program the computer. We don't need to look at brains. And um, what, when I got involved in this field, when I really, really became interested, was in 1979, which is, um, I was young, very young. Um, I had already, there had already been almost 30 years of AI. And I said, well, apparently it's not that easy, is it? You know, 30 years of effort and very, very little to show for it. And so it was sort of a, a bet on my part. I looked at brains and I said, well, you know what? Brains look an awful lot, they look very, very different than what people are trying to build in these AI machines. They got sensors, they move, they have all kinds of they, they distributed systems made of all these connections. And blah, blah. This, these guys are just writing code over here. And, and, you know, and they haven't had much success. So I took a bet. I said, I think the only way you're really going to get there is at least understand the one thing we know that is intelligent. You don't have to recreate it, but at least understand what it's, how it works. And that may be a good, a good path. And I think it, I felt very strongly it was the right path, but you couldn't prove it. Your, your attitude is correct, too. If someone, look, people can tell you, say, well, I can build a self-driving car without understanding how the brain works. Great, you can build a self-driving car. So you were making an intuitive leap here. Well, it was intuitive leap, but based also on a lot of observation. And now we're 60 years into the computing era, and people still admit we don't really know how to build intelligent machines using AI. It's still considered generally, you know, like in the dark ages compared to what a human can do. So that that guess that I made 30 some years ago is held true. It's not like the, the idea of studying brains is, is falling out of favor. And uh, I think it's become anything. It's become a very uh, well. Most people now recognize the fact that this is the right way to go forward. In my circles, I deal with a lot of people in the computing industry. Uh, and I give a lot. I speak to a lot of people at conferences and computing architectures, and there are quite a few people now who are con convinced that we really need to understand how the brain works, and that will lead to a whole new era of computing or learning machines, machine intelligence, that based on those principles. And, and now, by the way, uh, Marty, I know some of these principles, and I know what has to be included, even no matter how you're going to go about it. There's things you have to include that people aren't thinking about in the AI world. So it's not like um, one had to be right or one wrong. It's just that, you know, that's the way it turned out. The brains were a lot different than people thought. And so we better study them, at least understand them. So just as your view of artificial intelligence is very much a function of how you understand human intelligence, I'm wondering if it works the other way around with you, for you. In other words, has your immersion in artificial intelligence reinforced your belief that for all of our apparent complexity, you and I are nothing more than soulless machines. I don't believe there's anything to us that is, that is not manifest in our cellular structure and our genetics and our connectivity and, and the biology. There's no other additional thing that is outside of uh, explanation. Uh, there's no evidence for that. It's it, what people think, they could be like, well, I don't feel like a bunch of neurons. Well, fine, you may feel that way, but, but you don't really know what it is to feel like a bunch of neurons. Maybe this is exactly what it feels like to feel like a bunch of neurons, but there's no evidence whatsoever that well, there's something else going on besides that we can't understand, some metaphysical process that's happening. And, um, and I'm, all the evidence is we can completely understand exactly what's going on in your brain, and we're making great progress at that. And, um, and I don't think that's dehumanizing at all. <laughs> Being a student of the brain, you know that for centuries, scientists and philosophers have been wrestling with the question, you know, what is consciousness? Yeah. And all you have to do is look at a few back issues of the New York Review of Books to see that that debate is as heated as ever. Yeah, yeah. Will the building of artificial intelligence uh, in any way in your mind, uh, uh, your soulless mind, resolve that debate? These are terms that are highly laden emotionally or highly, you know, yeah. very uh, subjective terms. When you say consciousness or soul, I have to ask you what exactly you mean. You know, I, to me, consciousness is not a big, it's not something I worry well, about. Well, self-awareness, sentience. Yeah. yeah. You know, there are people who believe, uh, even neuroscientists who believe that consciousness is, is like the big problem. I'm not one of them. I think it's not a problem at all. You don't uh, think it's a problem at all? No, no problem at all. 
I mean, you can break down consciousness into some some components. So, Self-aware. Yeah. So, so I mean, here's a fundamental question in my mind: is how does the brain translate electrochemistry into feelings? Do yeah. you know? Do you understand what yeah, the answer yeah, to yeah. that is? Uh, I think I do. Oh, go ahead. Just give you a little picture of what's going on in your brain. Okay. Right? You've got some oh, eyes. Okay. Yes. You've got some ears. And, and by the way, coming off the back of your eyes, there's a million fibers. Okay, that's your optic nerve. You've got about 30,000 coming out of your ears from the cochlea, and you've got about a million coming out of your spinal cord, which is all your somatic senses. These fibers are identical. There's no difference between them. They send little spikes on them, these action potentials. They're identical. There is no light coming into your head. There's no sound coming into your head. There's no color coming into your head. These, are, these, these things that we talk about, like my language or this room, these are actually fabrications of your brain. Your brain basically gets patterns that have no effective quality to them whatsoever. None. They're just patterns. And yet we perceive the world in color, in richness, in depth, and uh, emotional affect. And, and all these things are there, but they're not in the signal coming into the brain. So it's, 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 it's actually a question is, why does vision seem different than hearing? That's, that's a fundamental question, because from the brain's point of view, actually from the neocortex's point of view, they're identical. The neocortex doesn't treat vision and hearing. It's separate. the same algorithm. Same algorithm. Yeah. Yet they're perceptually different. I mean, I don't confuse my sight of view with my hearing of view. They feel different. And this is the beauty of how the brain works. The brain builds a model of the world that, is, that reflects how the world actually is. Um, but it's a model. It's not, it doesn't actually know this. It has to, re, it has to discover this whole process. And so uh, it's, 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 I don't say we understand all of it, but you have to, part of the theory here is you have to understand that the brain actually builds this model so that the reason you seem 3D and in-depth to me is because the way the patterns change when I move my head. And then sound and, t and smell and touch are different than that. So these are what sometimes uh, scientists call them sensory motor contingencies. They, the, how the things change when you behave dictates how they are perceived by you, the kind of model you build. So uh, not a completely understood, but partially understood. And, um, and it's a, a fascinating that the whole thing is made up. I mean, our perception of the world is a fabrication of the brain. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about consciousness, as, as I understand it, the, the debate really uh, splits into two camps. Uh, there are the, the biological theorists who say that consciousness is ontologically distinct from the firing of neurons and that therefore no matter how intelligent the machine it'll never be self-aware it'll never be sentient and then there are the functional theorists who say that once you get a machine that's intelligent enough consciousness or self-awareness will inevitably follow and my understanding is that you're in the latter camp. I'm closer to the latter camp. Uh, I don't think it's some like once you're smart enough it happens. I think once you have the ability to recall previous memories and, and you have any neocortex, that is you can build a model of the world, then you'll be conscious. There was a report that was issued in 2011 by the United Kingdom Department of Trade and Industry predicting that intelligent machines would be demanding the same rights as humans <laughs> by the middle of the century, including housing, energy, and robo-health care. Who said this? This is, the United, this is a, an official report from the United Kingdom Department of Trade and okay. Industry. Well, yeah. just so uh, you, you, don't, just, you, you just can't take that report. You don't think Obamacare and health care for robots no, is going to be it's, an it's, issue? It's, I, this is ridiculous. Look, I think there's a separate question about, as I've, got, I've said many times here, if you built machines that are to be like animals, like humans, like they, yeah. to try to make them that they desire to live, and they, I mean, and that's possible to do. Right. Um, then you might run into some of these questions. Right. Uh, but that's unrelated to what I'm doing. You know, it's it really. I mean, I know you think they're, the, they're related. Well, humans have a big brain, yeah, all right. But but I think that's really science fiction. I don't know why you would want to build a machine like that. It's not like these machines are just going to discover one day like they want to have housing and health care. I mean, it's, it's it's crazy. Okay. We're building these. Machines. They're not building themselves. We're building. We can build whatever we want. So it's this idea that the robots are building themselves or taking away or running amok from us and out of control. This is nonsense. Um, if we want to build a machine that, that it, it may be 100 years from now, someone builds a machine that says, okay, we're going to replicate all the effective parts of a human. You know, we're going to go all this human emotions. They're going to want to have sex. They're going to want to do this, 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 this. Well, fine. They, someone might be able to do that someday. Uh, is it a good idea? Probably not. Um, if they do, what should we treat it? I don't know. That's unrelated to my work. That's, that's like science fiction someplace else. 
Well, you mentioned sex. I mean, there was a book that was published back in 2007 called, I know robots aren't your thing, but it was called yeah. Love and Sex with Robots. You know, I actually read that book. I wouldn't recommend it for children, but it was a really interesting what read. What was the basic but, premise? <laughs> well, the, look at the basic premise is, you know, we're going to have machines that are going to be more intelligent, yeah. that are going to be self-aware. We're going to definitely need them as caretakers, well, right? That okay. already makes sense so, in an aging so population. Roaming into areas I don't like to roam into here. Right. You know, if yeah. someone wants to build robotic sex slaves, well, maybe you don't want it to be very smart, do you? You know, you know, uh, maybe, interesting why, point. Why, why bother? Just, why? You, know, uh -huh. you know, just uh, make it placid. And, but, um, but you say you say we have to go way out of our way to make machines that are human like. But won't we do that? I mean, is that inevitable? I mean, well, when you think about the potential you ought to, then demand, you ought, to ask, you ought to interview the people who are talking about that. Yeah, because I don't do that. I know you don't do uh, that. So, so um, look, yeah, could you? I mean, I suppose someone might could do that. There'll People be an would, incredible market for it. Well, maybe. I mean, guys so, are just buying these crazy rubber dolls. So, so you know. It's so great. Let someone go after that. I think the question really, uh, today's question is, yeah. um, you know, what are the impacts of building machines that work on the principles of the brain? We haven't really talked about the benefits of that too much. Let's let's uh, talk about the yeah, benefits. But, but, yeah. and, let, and let's separate that from, you know, all kinds of, you know, but I think, called nerd, what'd you call it, nerd religion? Was it nerd, uh, uh, in the fantasy of the nerds or something like that? Oh, uh, the rapture of the rapture nerds. Rapture of the nerds, of the, the nerds. Right. <laughs> okay. right. I don't, I'm not one of that group. Okay. <laughs> Incidentally, though, I mean, I consider having a sexy robot a benefit, or it could Fine. be. But what are the benefits do you have in mind? The, to me, the real exciting part about this, and I, I probably won't live in long enough to see this, is I want to know about everything in the universe, right? I want to know about the origins of the universe. I want to know about what's out there. I want to explore the universe. I want to figure out, you know, the, the nature of uh, genetic expression. And I want to, you know, everything that scientists, we try to understand our, our situation. And I believe we can build machines that accelerate that dramatically. Can, sure. I, can I ask you just one more sex question? Sure. Uh, from a technological standpoint, what would be harder to do? Build an intelligent machine that can have an orgasm <laughs> or one that can, in a convincing way, fake an orgasm? Uh, I don't want to answer that question, <laughs> Marty. That's, that's below the quality of your... Um, your it's an interesting question. Oh. I mean, did you see that movie, Her? Uh, is that the one about... about the, yeah, the guy yeah, falls in yeah, love yeah, with yeah, the operating yeah, yeah, system? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, I thought it was um, really well done enough to be truly creepy. Uh, yeah. That was the reaction I had. Well, I think for, for people do fall in love uh, with bad things, you know, or things that aren't true. You yeah. know, we fall in love with humans who are not really good people. We, we people fall in love with their pets. They fall in love sure. with other things. So it's it's not inconceivable. I thought uh, I thought the uh, some of that movie was was definitely far fetched. But uh, you know, could someone really get attached to some technological thing? Sure. Yeah. Uh, no question about it. You know, will we build machines that can speak? Yeah, not uh, not convincingly, I think, as a human, because unless they have human life experiences, they won't be able to have, you know, it'd be like speaking to someone who grew up in a foreign world or something like that. Um, and could you become attached to something like that? Sure, I don't know. Let's see why not. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, the sex thing we can leave that. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> what you convey, I think, very uh, strongly is this pure joy of discovery. Yeah. But you, are, but you also think that it's going to, Make the world a better place. Oh, absolutely! And that's where it gets controversial, you know. Yeah, given well, all the concerns that have been, yeah, been expressed. Yeah, but you know, but I, don't get me wrong. I'm not in the back room there going, ah, "We're going to make a lot of money off of no, this." I thing. think you're in the back room saying, "My God, this is so exciting, so yes. interesting." That's what. Yeah, and, that's and what you're it's going to be so beneficial to humanity. It's like. You're sure about oh, that? Oh, I'm sure about the work. I, I don't. Doing, I don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about. All that. right. I think you're going to worry about. People who are building things that are self-replicating. You have to worry about people building really bad weapons. People, a lot of people who are self-replicating worries me. <laughs> yeah, you know. so we have but too much that going yeah, on yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for doing this program. Thank you. Th yeah, it's a pleasure, Marty. It great. Was a pleasure. And great questions. Uh, thank you. Take thank care. You.